So when the words, um, yes, I would love to be part of the lay pastor ministry came out of my mouth a few weeks ago, it all sounded like a really good idea. I mean, you know, why not? I think I had just finished listening to Audrey Rowe, or maybe it was Carolyn Berry, and I was so excited and, you know, inspired by what they had said. So fast forward to last night when I'm putting the last notes together, um, and I'm thinking to myself, why would they ever give me a pulpit to speak from? Oh well, too late now, they're stuck with me. So here we go. So today's passage describes two separate but connected miracles that Jesus performs. So the first one is when he feeds the 5,000 or so people, strangers, right, with a handful of loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And then he amazes his followers by walking on water and taking, directing their boat into safety. As I read this passage, I tried to imagine what it would be like to be one of the 5,000, you know, this incredible crowd that had been following Jesus, and, or what it would be like to be one of the disciples and see what was happening. We know from John's writing that the crowd wanted to make Jesus their king upon seeing what he had done, but that he went and he hid uh, so that they could not do this. It was one of those situations where, I mean, you see somebody feed such a large crowd from so very little, that definitely qualifies as a miracle, right? But I wonder where, who were these people? Where did they come from? Um, and why did Jesus decide that they should be fed? And I think about Philip. And I wonder what was going through his mind when Jesus said, where are we to buy bread to feed all of these people? And his response is, six months wages would never be enough, right? So in my family, we we get hangry. I don't know, if if you're not familiar with the term, this is a situation where a person is very hungry and very angry. And the hungrier they get, the angrier they become. So when we are hangry, my family, you do not want to be around us. Loving children turn into fire-breathing monsters. Uh, My very gentle husband goes into halt mode. Um, I think I'm the only one who's not affected. Um, You know, but it's really, really not pretty at all. And by the time you realize that somebody's hangry, it's too late because they're already there. You can't do anything about it. Um, And anything that you suggest or say to them is lost. The message is gone. I think Jesus understood that human condition, right? If our bodies are in discomfort, we cannot receive the message properly. We cannot see what it is that is being shown to us. So he felt that this crowd needed to be open to his message, and they needed to be receptive to the nourishment that they were about to receive. They didn't think there was enough food there for this to happen, but there was plenty of it. There was so much that there were leftovers in the end. So going back to Jesus' question um, in regards to where they could find the bread, I wonder if Philip was being just polite. And what he really wanted to say was, instead of six months' wages um, are not enough to feed them even just a little. And he wanted to say, are you kidding me? Who are these people? I work very hard to get my food. Why are we just feeding thousands for no reason? 
And I think his reaction would have been perfectly normal. You know? There's too many of them. How are we going to manage this? I think anybody would have lived, would have actually reacted the same way. We live in a world where we are always wondering if there is going to be enough. Right? It doesn't matter what the question is, is there enough? Is there enough food? Is there enough space? Is there enough time? Is there enough love for all of us? But Jesus was not concerned with this. He wasn't concerned with how much there was. He simply anticipated and he fulfilled that need. There were no questions asked, right? He understood that as soon as he looked at this crowd that was following him, he knew what they needed, and there was no need to wonder where anything was coming from. The truth is that there is no, no shortage of food in the world, right? There is plenty to go around. You can go to any restaurant in the U.S. and ask for your meal to be supersized. Um, you go to a buffet line and you'll find plenty of food out there that is being used and wasted. We do not live in a dystopian society where we are fighting each other for the scraps of food. Um, and yet, hunger is prevalent in the world. And malnutrition is prevalent in the world. There are more than 800 million people in the world suffering from hunger and malnutrition. And those are incredible statistics, even the fact that we are wasting millions of dollars in food every day on a daily basis. I have, you know, I joke sometimes, and it's not really a joke because I don't think it's funny, but I say sometimes that the vegetable drawer in my refrigerator is where all of my good intentions go to die, a slow death. So I put things in there and we forget that they're there. And it breaks my heart when I go back in and I find something that we could have prepared for a meal and now I have to throw it away because we didn't think of going in there. So there's really definitely not a, a shortage of food out there. So if the problem in the world isn't a shortage of food, then what is at the heart of this hunger problem that we are experiencing, right? So back to Phillips, six months of wages, not enough. And I'm not trying to pick on Philip because again, I think he's having a fairly reasonable reaction to the situation. But you would think that by now the disciples would know that Jesus doesn't ask any question to which he doesn't have the answer. They've been following him around for a very long time. So, you know, this is not news to them, that they're constantly being tested. So uh, one of the things that I find interesting is that the bread and the fish came from a child. I mean, there's 5,000 people in this crowd and only one person, a child, to boot, has any food on them, right? So I'm trying to figure out how this went down. You know, hey kid, what you got there? Hand it over. We have people to feed, right? There's all these people out here. We need to feed them. So I'm, I'm just trying to picture how that went down. But why a child? And I'm thinking that this child is representative of God's nature, God's given nature. What does a child want most in life? To be loved and to love. This is what children do. You love them, they love you back. Um, not much argument there. So I really think that there is hunger in the world because, not because of this lack of food, 
but because we have built-in excuses, right, to deal with, with what's happening in today's world. And we have built-in excuses for why we should not be sharing our food with those who are hungry. It's too expensive. It takes too much time. Or it's too complicated for us to figure out how to get food into the hands of those who need it the most. We're always coming up with reasons. We have no time. There is not enough time. We have convinced ourselves that it is within our purview to say who is worthy of a meal and who is not. Who is deserving on empathy and care and who should be left to fend for themselves. We've decided this already. And we're fairly logical about this, right? You have money, you get to eat. You don't, you should have thought about that before you get hungry. And it's left at that. We want to give drug tests to people who are applying for assistance with food before we decide that they are worthy of our compassion. This is what we're doing in today's world. But we think, if we think about Jesus, we know that he didn't think to stop to ask the many on the crowd if they live productive, productive lives before he decided, I'm going to feed you. Right? And I think, aren't we fortunate that we have a God that doesn't ask us to be perfect before he gives us his love and compassion? I struggle a lot with my faith. I remember when I was, um, when I was little, there was a period of time when my sister and I lived alone. We were probably about nine and 10 around that age. And there were days when we didn't know where the food was coming from. If somebody would forget or remember that there were these two little girls living alone and that food should come. So when I see my children, when I hear that they're hungry, I have this knee-jerk reaction. Going to bed hungry in my house as a punishment, it's not something that I would likely do because it's just not in me to do it. And any time my sister and I get together for Thanksgiving or, or a big meal, we often start talking about this. And I think it's because we are surrounded by so much food that you know, the memories just come flowing back and, and we have to talk about it. But this idea that we can let someone go without eating, it is just something that I, I don't react fairly well to. So I'm thinking, you know, this immense crowd and how Jesus knew from the very beginning that at some point we're going to have to feed them. He didn't ask, are you clean? He didn't say there's too many of you so you should get in line because in the end for Jesus, it wasn't about the bread and it wasn't about the fish, right? I don't think it was. In the end, I think it was more about God's capacity for love and compassion, which is never ending. We can look up the numbers for world hunger, right? There are statistics out there. But there are no statistics on how many people are suffering from spiritual starvation. We don't know what the numbers are. I worry about and I think about the person who can turn on the TV or listen to the news and know of a child who is dying of starvation, of sickness, or whatever it is that is out there, and they can still think to themselves, this is not my problem. This is not my child. This has nothing to do with me. Not because they're a bad person. This doesn't, no, but because there isn't enough. There isn't enough to take care of everybody. So we cannot open the door 
for others because there isn't enough. And yet, Jesus is not concerned with what we have done to deserve our nourishment. But we look at others and think, what have you done to earn yours? I am concerned with a person who is too worried about what's legal to see what is moral. Because we're so entrenched in our belief that there isn't enough and we are starved spiritually. So we cannot focus on Jesus' message of compassion for one another. It is lost. We're hurting, so we cannot see what he's trying to tell us. Just like the disciples who seem to constantly forget that God's grace is unending, there is an abundance of love that it has no rival, but we constantly forget this. And I think because of that, we're failing ourselves. Because there is more than enough for everyone, and we can share as much as we want to. So this is the point where I tell you um, that, yeah, things weren't exactly going well for me last night. So I was able to print some of what I needed to say, but not all of it. Um, in the second part of the passage, we know that the disciples have gone out to sea and the winds start blowing and they're afraid. Jesus had been in hiding for a little bit. They see him and they try to get him onto the boat. And then suddenly they're on the shore and they're safe and they reach their destination. So thinking back last night of how nervous I was feeling, I was feeling overwhelmed. I was like, oh my goodness gracious, what am I doing? And in the midst of all of that, I remember one thing. I remember that this is prospect. This is family. This is the place I call home. This is a place where I'm safe, where my children come and my family is. The past three years have not been um, very kind, I, I must say. It's been a lot of challenges for me spiritually. Um, and there are days when I'm thinking, am I enough, right? Am I enough to help my children navigate today's world and to teach them the skills that they need to survive and get them safely, you know, to some point in life? which, of course, is an unanswerable question, right? Um, am I enough to keep my family together? There is this, um, whenever I take Antonio into New York City, we take the New Jersey Transit, get off at Penn Station, uh, and then we take the subway downtown, the A train. And when we get off the A train on 14th Street, there is this, um, campaign that they put on the side of the walls. They're usually trying to do something with the subways. Um, and a month ago, it was a confusing campaign about men, but I didn't quite get the message. Um, I guess because it's for men, so only men are to understand it, I'm hoping. Um, but this, this week, this month, it's, it's a really beautiful campaign, um, and it's all women on the sides, and they're, they're doing different things, different activities, and there is a little saying on each of them. And there's one that captured my eye as I was walking by, and every time I walk by, I read it over and over again. And what it says is, we must make our shoulders strong enough so that others can stand on them. Wow, really, are my shoulders strong enough so that my children can stand on them and I can give them a lift so that other women, other people, other men can stand on them and be lifted and be taken safely to where they need to be. And I think about this journey of faith that we have embarked upon as Christians 
and how terrifying it can be for all of us. How alone sometimes we can feel and the pressure of knowing or thinking, not knowing, but thinking. We've convinced ourselves that we have to fulfill all of these requirements, right, for God to love us. But there are no requirements, right? He loves us, period. No questions. He's looked upon the sea of people, the more than 5,000, and said, this is what you need. And this is what you will receive, because that is what you need. And he has taken care of us. So, what do we do in looking back at these amazing miracles that God is performing? And thinking about the crowd and how they wanted to king to make Jesus their you know, proclaim him the king, and he's saying, no, no, he walks away because this is not what you're going to do with me. Because it wasn't about the miracles. It was about seeing the signs that God loves us, that his love is never-ending, that there is an overabundance out there of grace if we are ready to take it and receive it. And we don't have to worry about where it's coming from. We don't have to worry about how much it's going to cost because it's already been paid for. Amen.